Dear ladies and gentlemen, valued students of Hong Kong Business School, welcome to my lecture on how to succeed as an investor in China. My name is Lynn Rapsamen. I lived and worked in Asia for 13 years before returning to Switzerland recently. I'm partnering with the Hong Kong-based HSC Group, an independent investment management company. Let me shortly introduce to you what we do. We are investors on behalf of our clients and ourselves and have high conviction in China as an investment region. But we are also convinced that you must be an expert insider to be able to pick the right investments. We've been in the game since 2003, and our track record speaks for itself. We beat almost every competitor during the COVID-19 outbreak and are one of the very few investment managers who show positive performance for the year. Since the beginning of 2020 to the end of April, we are roughly 20% over benchmark and 10% positive in absolute terms. Morningstar, the leading fund rating service, awarded us with five stars. In this lecture, we will share our knowledge on what is needed to succeed as an investor in China. In the first part of this lecture, I'd like to take the investment manager's view and share some insights from a recent webinar we held pertaining to the corona crisis and how we managed to keep making money for our investors. I will also talk about our secrets, how we could be successful for 17 years now. In the second part, I'd like to take the investor's view and look at the investment case for China. Firstly, I will explain why China is still immensely underrepresented in investor portfolios, largely staying away from politics. I will close with some comments on the current US-China tensions and like during COVID-19, where we see the opportunities instead of the crisis. Now, let's jump right into the webinar for part one. Ladies and gentlemen, valued clients and guests, welcome to our webinar. We hope that you are safe and healthy during these unusual times. And we are going to talk about a topic today that has stirred quite some controversy over the last couple of months, especially during the Corona crisis. All markets suffered, but the Chinese one suffered least. Now there's obviously healthy skepticism about this whole situation and we are asking ourselves, is China lying about their data um, or you know, is there something else behind it? So let's talk about uh, China and something that is a little bit uh, more interesting than just China itself. Basically, we are talking about a fund that has really outperformed all other funds in the market. And with me today is Stefan Kreuchy. He is the CEO of HSZ Group in Hong Kong, and he's also the co-manager of the China funds that they're managing. So Stefan, you uh, are in China. I see the Chinese wall behind you. <laughs> or is that just, uh, is that just um, a cheat? Not really. No, it's thanks to uh, the technology that uh, we can uh, put ourselves wherever you like to be these days. <laughs> That's or amazing. Very so, uh, anyway, you are somewhere in Asia, and uh, Stefan, talk about yourself a little bit. You know, uh, introduce yourself a bit. What's the story? What brought you to Asia in the first place? Well, I always had a very strong affinity to to Asia, and also through my wife, of course, as uh, family ties to that part of the world. Uh, and moreover, in um, 2011, after having worked for um, UBS and uh, Credit Suisse and AIG for more than 20 years. I wanted to try my, to be an entrepreneur and start my own business. And so in uh, 2011, I um, was invited by Hans Rudolf Schmid, who is the founder and chairman of HSZ Group uh, to start my new venture on the roof of the HSZ in, in Hong Kong. And so I moved with my family to Hong Kong in 2000. And 11. Well, it seems like you're more Asian than, that, than I am, you know, you spent so much time in Asia itself. And you, you mentioned that you started the HSC China Fund in 2003, uh, and then you uh, sort of changed it to a Swiss fund or a fund on Swiss law in 2006. Can you tell us what the original idea was behind it when you launched it? 
Well, that was way before my time, of course. Yeah, the, as you say correctly, the strategy itself, with the same approach, was, was launched in 2003 as an investment company under the name of China Investment Corporation, and then uh, transformed into a Swiss fund in, in 2006. But the idea at that time and today was the same. It's a long only actively managed fund that invests primarily in entrepreneurial China, meaning in, in listed Chinese equities that are controlled by private sector and are not owned by the government. And so that's, that's still the same idea, nothing changed in that respect. We, today we can invest in uh, different share categories, of course, we can invest in the A shares that are listed in Hong Kong, but we can also invest in A shares that are listed uh, in the mainland China. And moreover, of course, we could invest in Chinese uh, companies that are listed somewhere else, be it the US or even other into places. The important thing that needs to be fulfilled is that all these companies need to do the majority of their business in mainland China. Well, it seems that the corona crisis suggests that local expertise in China can still help to generate alpha. So your fund outperformed the MSCI China index by roughly 18% since the beginning of the year. And you beat other actively managed China funds by lengths. But let's talk about China first. Where do you see the reasons that China's markets perform better than the rest of the world? Well, as you know, the coronavirus or the crisis started in China. But China took uh, very aggressive measures early on to minimize the outbreak. As you know, they locked down over 60 million people in, in Wuhan and the surrounding areas in order to stop the spreading of the virus. Um, I think thanks to those drastic measures that, that China took, but probably also due to the discipline of people you know, in, in China in order, in, in order to follow government um, orders, I think China was able to stop that uh, faster and, and to come out faster out of this crisis. Moreover, of course, the Chinese government has, as many other governments in the world, has taken some measures, has uh, put in place uh, uh, some stimulus response, uh, including some uh, injection of liquidity in the financial system, but also tax concessions and uh, subsidies to certain subsidies to, to certain um, companies and, and individuals. And uh, as a result of that, the IMF came out recently and is expecting that China will uh, or be able to recover and, and probably should even have a slightly positive growth for uh, 2020, whereas the rest of the world is going into a recession and is probably on the different economic blocks like Europe and US probably will show quite significant negative growth rates for 2020. But despite that, we believe the investment case for China is unchanged. China is still the second largest economy in the world. They're not stuck in the middle income trap, unlike many other um, countries in, in Asia or also in South America. China has a stable and, and solid leadership in place. And also the positioning of international investors still doesn't reflect the weight of China in the world today. Well, then let's move to our fund. At the moment, the HCF, as we call it, the High Set uh, China Fund, is one of the top funds in Switzerland. So congratulations for that. Morningstar awarded us a five-star rating, and the performance is positive 10% since the beginning of the year, roughly, which I think not many other equity funds can claim for themselves. So, Stefan, is this just coincidence? Or is that skill? I hope it's not uh, luck or coincidence, but uh, of course, luck is always needed in uh, investment as well. But um, let me uh, explain to you why I think it's not just luck that we did better than the market in, in over the last few years. In order to do that, let me quickly highlight some points in our investment philosophy. We are bottom-up stock pickers with a value bias. So we don't, we don't care really about uh, indices like MSCI or CSI or 
uh, whatever FT, F, FTSE 50 or whatever China index. So we, we really just care about individual companies and we look for superior uh, companies that we, we put together in a portfolio. So that helps us, you know, to be more flexible. We don't need to own stocks in certain areas or certain sectors just because they're in the index. We only own those stocks that we like. And in order to do that, of course, we need uh, to be very disciplined. We need to do a lot of research and we need a high level of conviction because, as I said, we are very concentrated. We only hold between 20 and 25 stock, stocks at any given time. So we need to know what we own. So we, we um, as I show here, you know, we are happy to share that with investors from time to time, what stocks we own, because that's the only thing we do is investing in single stocks. How do we select these stocks? I mean, an important criteria in selecting the stocks to go into our portfolio is what we call the inner strengths. Inner strengths consist of a, a number of um, quantitative and qualitative factors. Uh, among the, the quantitative is earnings per share growth, but also the return on invested capital. In terms of the more soft factors, we look for clarity and consistency of the strategy of the investee companies, but I also want to make sure that they have a culture in place that nurtures integrity. So just give you an example recently, maybe you read the unfortunate negative press about Locking Coffee, the competitor of Starbucks in China, where obviously they were, were cheating and, and, and faking some of, of their um, sales numbers. So it's very important that, you, uh, that we have a company that follows that type of uh, culture. So in terms of uh, soft factors, we also look for a franchise. You know, do these companies have a franchise? Do they have a competitive edge that allows them to grow in their niche profitably and strongly for the foreseeable future? All this, of course, is very difficult, but it has to be available also at a reasonable price. So we have our own valuation methodology that we developed over the years, and that has been very much the same since 2003. We estimate different factors that we then use in order to come up with a fair value for those companies that we invest. And of course, in order for us to invest, the value of these companies has to be higher than the current share price. Why is that important? Because the weighting in our portfolio is based on the relative attractiveness. Because as I said earlier, we do not follow a benchmark. So how do we decide how much we put in one single stock? So that's all based on the relative attractiveness, meaning the stocks that have the highest undervaluation, where the value is the, the most above the, the current price, those are the stocks that have the highest um, weight in our portfolio. In terms of the companies, as I said, it's the focus is on entrepreneurial China, meaning uh, stocks that are controlled by the private sector and that are not majority owned by the Chinese government. We do not make macro calls, so cash in our portfolio is really just technical. So we hold a little bit of cash, but as a default, we are fully invested at any given time. Also, we do not employ leverage, also we do not use hedges. We are purely investing in, in good stocks and, and that's all we do. Also, as I said before, we do not have a, a sector allocation. A sector allocation is, is the result of the bottom-up stock picking we do and never a function of top-down decisions. Last but not least, I think the team is important. We have a very good team in place, a good mixture between experience of Hans Rudolf Schmid, with more than 30 years experience in the investment industry and myself with over 30 years in that business as well, combined with local know-how. We have an analyst team of three analysts in Hong Kong that um, have, some of them have Hong Kong, some have mainland Chinese background, but also they're a bit younger than us. I think that helps us to, to understand the universe of stocks that we look at. Well, thank you, Stefan, for uh, sharing the success factors with us, why uh, your fund is uh, so successful. And I guess, you know, despite all of China's skepticism that we're seeing out there, it still shows that a rigorous portfolio management process as you are um, uh, doing for your funds 
can emphasize what China does really well. And you mentioned Chinese entrepreneurship. And I guess, you know, this is something uh, where uh, we, are, we all agree that uh, Chinese are very entrepreneurial people. And can you maybe share with us a couple of examples of transactions that you just did uh, recently during the Corona crisis that led to your success? Yes, you know, as of course, it's um, difficult to make any short term decisions when such a crisis comes, because as nobody else, we didn't see this crisis come definitely not in this type of, uh, in this magnitude that it has hit the, the globe now. But we believe there were several trends and developments in place that we have identified some time ago. And I think that those trends have materialized much faster than we had ever imagined as a result of this crisis. What do I mean? I mean by that, that talking about e-commerce, online medical services, online gaming, also online education, those are sectors that extremely benefited from the, from the crisis, but those are investments we have made already some time ago because we, we saw that these trends are important and that's, that's where the, the world is going. So let me give you some example. One is obviously Alibaba that I guess everybody knows. So, um, but I want just to say that we invest in the company already in 2016 um, at the price of $71. Meanwhile, that stock is listed in, in trading in the US market at uh, 210 US dollars. Meanwhile, of course, the stock is also listed in Hong Kong and we own the Hong Kong share, but originally we bought the US share at the outset. Then I mentioned the online healthcare. There's, we have two examples that we have invested. One is Alibaba Health, of course, a, a leading online drug store platform and, and also uh, the help in the digitalization of the medical supply chain and, and many other uh, important parts of the um, digitalization of the medical world that are active. This stock we bought originally in, in 2018 at the price of seven Hong Kong dollar. Meanwhile, that stock is trading at $20 in Hong Kong. Then the, the other example in the online healthcare is Penang Healthcare. That's a leading online healthcare platform. Obviously, as people were locked up in their homes, but they still needed medical advice. So they, the only thing they could do is obviously uh, con call or contact these online medical um, platforms that would help them, give them advice around the clock. And so those are, are things that uh, happen much faster, I believe, than they would have otherwise without the crisis. Um, this... Um, Stock we bought um, only last year, about one year ago, at fifty dollars. And meanwhile, it's uh, trading in Hong Kong at one hundred twelve Hong Kong dollars. And ten cent, another very well known uh, company, uh, all around internet leader, but also a leader in mobile games. And and as people were sitting home with their kids, a lot of them, of course, were were happy to use those online games during that lock up period. But also otherwise, um, ten cent is very much involved in. Chinese daily life is over 1 billion monthly active users. I mean, through their uh, app, probably WeChat, that some people might know, which is the Chinese um, uh, correspondent of WhatsApp. Tencent we bought already, already in 2013 at um, 93 Hong Kong dollar. Meanwhile, that stock is trading at uh, 412 Hong Kong dollars. And finally, it's online education, education in general, a big topic in China, Chinese households, meanwhile spend a lot of their uh, household income on education for the kids because Chinese do believe in education and believe that, and I think that's also the reason why China is doing so well uh, in compared to other, many other countries in the world. TL we bought in uh, 2018 at 37, meanwhile the stock is trading at 50 US dollars. Um, so to um, sum up, I mean, we have um, obviously, as you can see here, a very concentrated portfolio. The top 10 uh, stocks make up uh, around 60% of the portfolio and the remaining 14 positions are about 40% of the portfolio. Also, as you can see here, very little cash, only half a percent. So that's what I said earlier. Cash is just uh, a technical liquidity that we need, but we do not make macro calls terms of um, 
increasing or decreasing the cash level in the fund when we think the market is going going down. And it would have paid off as, as we all know, um, you know, if you had uh, raised more cash because the market came back very vigorously and probably one would have missed the recovery in the market had one tried to time it. So I see that really active reallocation into the sectors that performed well during this crisis has clearly shown that your expertise in China has generated alpha in, in these times, you know, especially when markets are moving fast, it seems like active management is still uh, outperforming the market by lengths. So Stefan, your fund is also since recently uh, a PRI signatory of the UN and therefore ESG compliant. Now, there's been some recent criticism about that label and that funds that use this label squeeze more fees out of investors. And what is your take on that? Yeah, I've heard that too. There was some criticism recently because, you know, there's a, a real industry, I think, that has emerged uh, supporting different um, uh, pension funds and asset managers in terms of, um, you know, the taking care of that topic of the ESG of this uh, sustainable investment. And, um, but in our case, I, I can assure investors that we do not charge any additional fee for that. Actually, we couldn't do it. It wouldn't be um, on the Swiss law. You couldn't do that anyway, but we are uh, accessing the available resources that are already accessible to us within the framework of those uh, tools that we use, like information systems such as Bloomberg and other systems that do provide such information already. So no, we, for us, it will not have any impact on the <coughs> cost or, or the uh, total expense ratio of our fund. As, if there's any cost, it will be covered out of the, um, of the management fees that are charged to the fund. Moving on to the second part of our lecture, and now I would like to take the investor's view. There are always arguments for and arguments against investing in a certain region, and that depends a lot on personal taste and preferences. However, we see it from a much bigger picture. Although we are bottom-up managers and perform quite well during tactical shorter-term adjustments, such as the current corona crisis, our philosophy is to look at the world as a whole from a macro perspective. What matters to us are long-term trends in trade and money flows as well as global power balances. Investing in China means investing in an infinite game. Let me explain to you why we believe in China. In China, nothing is ever about the short term. I'm sure some of you got frustrated in the past trying to deal with the Chinese as they seem to have so much more time to make decisions. They work on a different time scale. The government still works on five-year plans. When Deng Xiaoping opened up the economy in the late 1970s, it started a decades-long development. It doesn't mean that developments do not happen fast, quite the opposite. But they always happen within a long-term framework, which I call vision. With a vision, there is no goal or end in what you do. Following a vision, a dream, a conviction is an infinite game. You will reach milestones, but never cross the finish line. And the Chinese are determined about one vision. They want to become rich. And they won't stop at the point where they overtake the biggest economy in the world. I told you in the beginning that we believe that the world is still massively underinvested in China. Let me substantiate this with some numbers. In terms of market capitalization, which means how much listed companies are worth, the US is still by far the largest in the world, coming close to half of the global volume. China has caught up in the last decades, but still fades beside the US with less than 10% of the global total. Most stock market indices take market capitalization as a reference, and that's why most investor portfolios still treat China as emerging market with a minimal allocation. However, if we look at the real economy, the chart looks significantly different, less skewed towards the US, and China is catching up fast. The reason of the US dominance in capital markets is that the US dollar is the world's reference currency. While the US dollar is indispensable in global capital market trades, the real economy sometimes finds its way around it 
such as creating RMB clearing banks in several countries to facilitate trade settlement. Granted, it is an uphill battle, but it is a start. The limited capital flows in China are a millstone around their neck to develop their financial markets. And that is a challenge that isn't going to be solved anytime soon. Nevertheless, the point is that as an investor, you shouldn't be interested in the absolute numbers. You should be interested in the growth potential. And despite a closed capital market, China managed to grow its GDP by 51 times in the 40 years between 1980 and 2020, whereas it was only eight times in the US in the same time period, which means China grew faster by a factor of 6.4. In terms of GDP per capita, it is 40 times and five times respectively, which is a factor of eight. So the average Chinese person has become eight times richer than the average US person over the last four decades. Moreover, China is slowly overtaking the US as the largest exporter for the majority of the world. Within less than 20 years, China usurped the US as the largest supplier of goods for about two thirds of the world. Needless to say, that these growth dynamics create more investment opportunities. If these numbers haven't convinced you yet about the investment case of China, then nothing will. But you have to know your risks too. China is a market of insiders and outsiders. As an outsider, you can be burned badly. There is still a lot of irregularities and outright fraud going on, as the market framework still leaves room for that. As mentioned before, Lucking Coffee is one of the recent cases that laid bare the gaps in the system. This is why we still believe in active investment management in China. While I would not invest in active strategies for efficient markets like the US and developed Europe, China is a different animal. If you see the opportunities in China, you also have to consider the risk. They are of a different nature than those in developed markets, and therefore need to be managed in a different fashion as well. I'd like to conclude here by thanking you for your participation. If you are interested to learn more about our investment capabilities, please connect with me on LinkedIn. You will find me under my pretty unique name, Lynn Revsamen, or drop an email to info at Thank you for watching and goodbye.